Welcome to Celebration Church Online. We're so glad to have you joining us for church today, which is exclusively online. We're about to get our service started with worship, but before that, we wanna give you some tips on how to help you get engaged in today's service. If you're watching this on celebrationedmonton.online, there is a section on the right of your screen to view today's sermon notes, access the Bible, our online connect card, as well as a chat window. We encourage you to jump into the chat, say hello, and engage in discussion during today's service. We always have a button on the top right to request prayer, and we have a team standing by that would love to pray with you. If you have kids, we have Celebration Kids curriculum on our website for you and your kids to enjoy. Click the COVID-19 updates and select Kids Curriculum tab. Before we get started, who's in your life that you need to share this service with? Take a moment right now and share this live stream on Facebook, text it to a friend or email it to a friend and invite someone to watch with you right now. Grab your coffee, get comfortable and enjoy the service. Hey, welcome to church. We're so excited to worship with you today, but I just want to encourage you, no matter where you're at, stand up. We're going to sing a couple of songs, and we'd love for you to engage and just worship with us. Never read to 
Hey, we know that this week might have been a bit crazy, but we just encourage you, let's press into worship and continue to worship this morning. There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. When I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another ring of fire standing next to me. There was another ring of waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminders? set free there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me there is another in the fire oh my dead left the dead beneath the wall No longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I will bow to the things of this world. And I know. And I know I will never be alone. 
take this time to pray together as a church. And, you know, we really want to be together during this time. Even though we're apart, we still want to meet each other's prayer requests, each other's needs. So we really want to encourage you to go online on the church website and share your prayer requests with us because we want you to know that we're here for you. We want to pray with you. And we also want you to know that if there's anything at all that you need in any area, we really want to come alongside you. We really want to help you out in any practical way we can. So we've actually created a care team that's going to help meet such needs as picking up groceries or pharmacy or prescriptions or any kind of practical needs or even referrals for child care. We would really love to help you with that. So how to do that is go on our website at celebrationedmonton.com and click the COVID-19 button and follow the links. So right now, I'd like to pray for a few things. But before I do that, I really want to read out a prayer request that we had that came in last week. And, you know, our prayer requests are so, are so great. And actually, our praise reports, too, are also, also really good. And so this praise report here, what it says um, is, sorry, I can't, oh, there it goes. <laughs> After suffering through two heartbreaking miscarriages, my husband and I have been hoping to be blessed with a be- beautiful baby one day. After a five-year struggle with unexplained infertility, our doctor decided to refer us to a fertility clinic. However, in January, just a few days after my doctor referred us, we conceived naturally. This is a miracle from God. Isn't that awesome? Please continue to pray to keep this baby growing so we can hold it in our arms come October. So we really want to see so many more prayer requests like this during this difficult time. We really believe there's going to be miracles out there. So we want to pray together for a few things today. We want to pray for finances, first of all. It's affected so many people's finances and economic stability. We want to pray for guidance and wisdom from our government and our leaders as they're making these important decisions. And also, we want to pray for healing for everybody who's been affected. And we'll pray for this baby as well. So let's pray together for some of these prayer requests. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, that you are the God provides for all of our needs. So right now, we pray for these many requests, Lord God. We pray for that baby. We thank you, God, that wonderful need being met, Lord God, in that family. We pray for protection and health for that baby and the mom. Father, we also pray for finances, for finances for everyone, the economic situation, Lord God. We thank you. You're the God who provides all of our needs according to your riches and glory as we trust in you. And Father, also we pray, Lord God, for our officials, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for giving them wisdom. We thank you for our prime minister, our premier, our health officials. Father, we know that they have many decisions to make. And Father, we pray that your wisdom would be upon them as they do that, Lord God. And lastly, Lord God, we pray for everyone, Father, who's been affected. Lord God, for healing for them, for their families, for protection for them, Lord God. And right now, we pray for protection over every single person who is watching this today, Lord God. We pray for healing, Lord God. We just thank you for Psalm 30 one that prays that that gives us that protection and father we just thank you lord god for your blood and your protection over us in jesus name amen let's continue to worship
price for my heart And I don't have a context For that kind of love I don't understand I can't comprehend All I know is I need you I run to the Father I fall into grace Welcome again to Celebration Church Online today. We just finished our time of worship together. If you recently tuned in, we're so glad to have you with us for today's service. In just a moment, our lead pastor, Dennis Vardy, is about to bring us a special message. I encourage you to follow along with the sermon notes. If you're watching on celebrationedmonton.online, they're on the right of this video. You can also pull them up using your phone using our Celebration Edmonton app. Let's jump into our message right now. Well, hello, Celebration Church. So good to be together and to do church together. I just want to give a shout out to Central, Northwest, and By Faith, Southwest. We're still believing God. So uh, we haven't stopped those things. I hope you had a great week. I hope you had a great week. You know, I had a great week, and we're just so excited that we're able to be with you on our usual service times, 9 30, 11, and 12 30. And then again, 6 o'clock. We added 6 o'clock in the evening as well on Sundays. And so I just want to encourage you make the most of this, uh, not only by you engaging and, and you taking this in, but, you know, inviting your friends. Just call them up. Say, hey, I want you to come to church by staying home. <laughs> and, uh, you know, let them know how they can tune in and be a part of this. And of course, you can use, um, you can use social media to, you know, share these things a- afterwards. And it'll be an awesome way to really reach out to people. It's funny because, you know, during this, this time, I've had more conversations this week where I ended up inviting people to church. And, and it's, and it's kind of weird because it's, it's like, 
hey, you should come to her church, but not now, <laughs> you know, um, sometime, and here's how you can come now, but, you know, later, you know, in person, and so I, I just encourage you, make use of this. Um, you know, there, there, is, there is opportunity in this adversity, and uh, you, can, you can minister the gospel. We, we've just been doing church all week, like connect groups have been happening, you know, we just changed the format of them, and people have been getting on, uh, you know, the, the different mediums that are out there, Zoom and Facebook meeting and things like this. We got like 13 connect groups meeting with the youth and a bunch more with adults, and people just being able to connect and pull up their faces on the computer and have a conversation, encourage one another, you know, and it didn't work so well for the hockey group, nobody could see where the puck was, but, but we're really trying here, and I just want to encourage you, use technology, use technology for fellowship. Um, you know, just because you're in isolation doesn't mean you're isolated, and, and there's a difference. Um, and of course, during this season, prayer is a, a big part of what is happening, and um, if you don't already know about it, uh, I hope that you've already connected with the 21 days of prayer that we started this week. Uh, you know, we, we found out that it took 20 days in Italy for the coronavirus to go from just over 200 people to over 20,000 people. So I thought, well, why don't we just do 21 days of believing God and, and praying and short circuit this thing and believe God to turn it around quicker and, and stop it. And, and so that's what we've set out to do. So you can go to Facebook and Instagram uh, literally every day at noon. We'll be posting another uh, prayer focus for the day, just a couple minutes long that just says, hey, here's a scripture, here's a thought, here's our focus, let's pray together, believe God together, uh, and, you know, go ahead and, and leave a comment if you want. I heard you get a free roll of toilet paper if you do that, I don't know, <laughs> but you can, you can go ahead and give that a try, um, but I, I, think, I think prayer is pretty high on the agenda right now. And uh, I, just, I just see a lot being said from different Christians that I know, different churches and, and Christian organizations. And, you know, just believers everywhere just realize, you know, we need to take something that, I, what I love is that we don't wait for a crisis to pray. We, we have a prayer habit in our church. So engaging in prayer in a crisis is like, well, this is easy because we, we do this anyway. And I, I just love the commitment that I'm seeing right, right across the board of churches rising up and praying and believing God. And I mean, it's so bad. Even atheists are praying. I mean, it's the most amazing thing. They're getting together, staying six feet apart, of course, but nevertheless. Um, but that's the way it is. It's a time and a season of intense prayer as we, we battle through uh, dealing with this coronavirus. So our desire is to learn to pray effectively. That's really what it's about. That, that's what you know, the scriptures encourage. In fact, in James it says that, that we can have effective prayers and then it gives us a model when it points to Elijah as our example and says, look at Elijah. He, he prayed and he stopped the rain. He prayed and it rained again. And, and, and as a matter of fact, I wanna have a look at one of the prayer meetings that Elijah was a part of out of 1 Kings chapter 18, there's an amazing uh, experience that happens in, in Elijah's life, uh, that Elijah being a prophet of God, and, and now he's challenging all, all of these uh, you know, idol worshipers and these prophets of the idol Baal and all the rest of it, and he's having this interaction with them, and, and so he, he's like, well, how long are you people gonna hesitate between two opinions? You know, we need to have a, a prayer showdown here and, and get into it, and he says, listen, I'm, I'm all by myself, but there's 450 of you, and, and, and so he says this, he says, uh, tell you what, we're gonna pray, and then we're gonna call in the name of, name of your God, he says, and I'll call on the name of my God. So you're going to call on your God. I'll call on my God. And, and we're going to have this kind of a prayer off, if you will. And, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. So we're going to set this up, call down fire. Whatever God answers, well, well, he's God. That'll settle it. We won't have any debate anymore. I love how it says afterwards, it says, and all the people said, that's a good idea. At any rate, so, so they begin to have this, and of course, as the story goes, he gets, uh, you know, the, these 450, they get the ox, and they slaughter them, and they set up their, their uh, you know, sacrifice there, and they're going to call on their gods, and, and then the Bible says that they took these oxen that were given and prepared, and they put them out, and they started to pray. They started to pray and call on Baal from uh, morning until noon. Oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice. 
And there was no answer. And then, this, then the Bible says they, they leaped about the altar, which they had made. So now they've gone from just gathering and praying to now it's praying and leaping. You know what I'm saying? And, and now they, and then it says about noon, Elijah starts to mock them. So here they've been going all morning right to lunchtime. About lunchtime, Elijah's like, I've had enough of this. I'm just going to make fun of these guys. And he's like, maybe your God's asleep. Maybe get a little louder. You can wake him up. Maybe he's gone to the bathroom. You got to wait till he comes back. You know, he just starts, starts razzing these guys. And so the scripture says they cried out with a loud voice. And then they began cutting themselves, you know, according to their custom, with swords and lances until blood gushed out. So here they are trying to get their false god to move. They're being loud. They're going long. You know, they're doing all this stuff. They're cutting themselves. Thank God we serve a God who cut himself so I don't have to cut myself uh, for him to hear me. And, and, then, and then I love this. About midday, the Bible says, they raved until the time of the evening sacrifice. This is the first rave in the Bible right here in uh, 1 Kings 18. So here they are, they're doing all this, but the result was no voice, nobody answered. Of course, the fire did not fall. Then you look at the prayer for Elijah. You know, eventually these guys are just like, okay, it's nighttime, it's, it's his turn. You know, we've, we've taken all day and all night, it's his turn. And he gets the oxen, the sacrifice ready, and he douses it with water three times, and it's like a moat around there. I mean, it's just absolutely soaked. And then Elijah steps up, and he says this. He says, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O oh Lord, are God, and that you have turned their heart back again. It says in the very next verse, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, the dust, licked the water up that was in that trench, and all the people began to cry out, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. I love that story. I love the description that's there, but I look at, I look at those prophets trying to pray and they're, you know, they're long and they're loud and it's painful, you know, and they're crying out to God and they're begging and they're, they're defeated. There's not, no faith left. There's no results that are happening. And then Elijah steps up with just in a sense of authority and gets results right away. You know, sadly though, sometimes people's prayer life, believers, look more like the prophets of Baal than they do Elijah. I want a prayer life that looks a lot more like Elijah than it does that other bunch. You say, what's the difference? Elijah understood his authority, his relationship with the Lord. And so he prayed from a position of faith and, and a position of confidence. And I want to help build that today as we, as we take time to get into God's word. That's my goal is to, is to just help build a sense of confidence about prayer in your life. So as we get started, the first thing I wanna say is this, and we're, we're gonna go down to some fundamentals that are so important to understand because if you don't have a proper foundation about your view of God and your view of, of the world and how all this works, then your prayer life will be uh, off kilter, so to speak. God has given us authority and responsibility to rule on the earth. This is the starting place of, of having authority in prayer. You know, most people, and that includes a lot of Christians, you know, as well, they'll, they'll just, they sort of don't really understand that. They kind of look at the world and they say, well, you know, God created the world and everything that happens around us, well, that's just what he's doing. And, and then we kind of look at it and we kind of evaluate it and try to understand it and because they have a position that goes like this. Well, whatever happens has got to be, you know, the will of God, otherwise it wouldn't happen. And I'm sure God always gets his way or, or whatever the will of God is, well, well, that's what's going to happen. And, but if, if you think like that, it'll literally undermine your prayer life because you will evaluate and you will wonder what God is doing when you should actually be fighting and addressing the problem and using your faith in God to change the situation rather than accrediting it, accrediting it to him. One of the problems with this kind of thinking is we just get deceived. You can't have the devil attacking your life and then pray effectively to stop that attack if in the back of your mind you subconsciously think that this is from God. 
that there's some, you know, some extra purpose to this that we just don't quite understand in our life. And so, and so we need to fight attacks. We need to understand, no, evil goes on in the world. It is not from God, but we have a God who stands with us to battle these things. I'm not going to be able to read all of the verses, but they're in your notes. You can read the whole verse. But I'm just going to touch on some of the thoughts of them as we go through them. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 says, Then the Lord said, let's, let's make man in our image according to our likeness. And then he says this, Let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the cattle of the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created a male and female. He created them. God blessed them. And God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And then he said this, and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and everything that moves on the earth. God created mankind. God created the earth. But then he hands it off to us and he says, you rule. You're in charge. It's yours. Here, the, I, I made it, but it's yours. We're to rule. That literally means we're to have dominion. We're to dominate, if you will. We're to subdue. That means to overcome and bring into subjection. And so there are things that go on in the earth that, that we're not to st- sit back and go, well, I wonder what God's doing. No, if it's evil, you're supposed to subdue it. You're supposed to overcome it. You're supposed to bring it into subjection. Clearly, God has put mankind in charge of the earth. We are responsible for how, uh, how we run it and how we operate. We are in charge, and we have been given not only the responsibility, but the authority to deal with the issues of life that happen on earth. Psalms 115 verse 16 says, the heavens are the heavens of the Lord, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. The earth he has given. Here in the Psalms, David is reiterating what Genesis already told him, that the earth was given to mankind. We have been put in charge. God has given it to us. It is under our dominion, our rule. We are to subdue it. In Psalms 8 and verse uh, 3, the scripture says this, When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars which you have ordained, what, uh, what is man? that you take thought of him, and the son of man, that you care for him. Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crowned him with glory and majesty. Now listen to this. You made him to rule over the works of your hands, to have put all things under his feet. So God says, listen, I've made man, and I've made man to be awesome, but I've also given him the the job of ruling over the works of God's hands. That is, creation is the work of God's hands and we have been given authority over it. So if that's the case, then why do some Christians have a prayer life that looks like everything that happens is being run by God and he's just making it all happen and we're just kind of subject to whatever's going on? Their prayers end up looking more like begging God to act They pray from a position of defeat and weakness instead of acting like, as God has already said, that they are in charge, that they are to rule over the works of his hands, that their prayers need to look like they are the ones responsible, they are the ones in charge, they are the ones, uh, you know, to determine what should be going on allowed and disallowed going on in the earth. You and I were given charge over this world. Our prayers need to come from a position of authority and responsibility, not looking at stuff that goes on around us that we know is evil, we know it's wrong, we know it's painful, and somehow thinking, well, maybe that's God. No, it's not. It is something that you and I were meant to fight and meant to deal with. Here's another thought. Stop calling evil good and good evil. You know, when do we do this? Well, the church has been guilty of of this in the past, pointing to things like progress and then saying it's worldly. You know, when it comes to pointing to good and calling it evil, uh, that's been done in the past by the church historically. You know, we look at a car, we go, oh, that's a worldly item. We look at clothes, those are worldly clothes. Or a house, well, that's kind of a worldly house. I don't know what color you have to have it to be a worldly house, but... You know, this is an old way of thinking that was in the church for a season and 
The truth is that those are just inanimate objects that do not hold any morality to them whatsoever. Um, they can only get the morality of those that possess them. But what's at the heart of the one that possesses it is what determines whether it's good or evil. You know, computers by themselves are not evil. But if they're allowed to be used for pornography, that's evil. Television at one time was just considered evil because it was television. You know, I can remember, you know, he hearing people call it television, you know, kind of thing. Well, what they're saying is, you know, here, here's this TV, here's this computer, and, and sometimes there's stuff that's on it that's wrong, that's evil or whatever. Well, that's true. But I'll tell you right now, every computer and every television across this world is church. It's being used for the glory of God. It's being used to preach the gospel. It's being used to bring hope and faith and life in, in, into people. And so we're not gonna call something good as though it was evil. But we also shouldn't call something evil as though it's good. We live in a fallen and broken world. And the original sin, Adam and Eve falling, opened the door to sickness and disease. Even Jesus confirmed that. People will rationalize problems in life and, and come up with a, a theology that sort of says, well, God has done this so that he could like teach us something. Well, what that is, is you're now calling evil good. Right. You're attributing something evil to a good God, saying that God allowed this to happen because maybe he's preparing us for something greater, some kind of a talk like this. Really? Like, really? Th think about that. I mean, is that what you're going to tell the parent of a child who's in the hospital struggling with cancer that somehow God's allowed this because there's some good thing that he's going to... Are you really going to do that? Are, are you going to tell that to somebody who got rescued out of sex trafficking that God allowed that because there's some greater purpose? Are you going to tell that to the surviving family of, who've lost a loved one because of a drunk driver or something like that? Don't, don't look at evil and call it good. You know, even this week, I had somebody share a, a tweet with me that they copied and sent to me. About, and, and the tweet went something like this. It was about how God must have brought the virus to teach us to be able to have more time to read our Bibles and pray because we idolize watching sports. And so this is what caused the, you know, the NBA and the NHL to have to shut down so we could have more time. I mean, I just can't believe the thinking that is behind that. Like really, so God caused all these people to die so that sports could be canceled on television so you could have more time to read your Bible. No. Don't call evil good. You might have more time for spiritual things because of the change that has been brought into the world and in this situation, but the end does not point to the origin. Just because God, because God uses something in your life doesn't mean that he caused it to happen in the first place. Don't ever look at things that have gone on in your life that are messed up and, and, and then just because it turned to something good, that, well, God must, no, 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 don't go there, don't go there. You know, God used Haman's hatred of Mordecai and his hatred of the Jews to promote Esther and to save the Jews and turn that whole situation around. But God did not put a hatred in Haman's heart. God, God used Joseph's position in prison to get him to the throne and to save many people. But it wasn't God who caused his brothers to become jealous and mistreat Joseph. God will use the past that you have as a testimony to his glory when he turns your life around and you begin to live for Jesus. But it wasn't God who caused some of those things that have gone on in your past. The scripture teaches us that God causes all things to work together for good. Romans 8, 26 and 28. I, I love how these passages are in the context of prayer. You know, where, where it's just talking about prayer and then it gets down further in the verse and it says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. Listen, God causes all things to work together for good, but God doesn't cause all things to happen. That's right. yeah. We don't go through difficult times 
or when we rather go through difficult times, God may develop something, some good things in our, in our life out of it, but that does not mean he sent the difficulty. If we view our problems as being sent by God, how can you pray with authority to stop them? You've got to settle this issue in your heart. Don't buy into a religious, weird idea that because good things can happen out of bad things, that somehow God sent the bad thing. The bad thing is still bad. And you need to pray with authority to stop it, turn it around, and bring an end to it. And in fact, see God bring something good out of it anyway. Here's another thought. Jesus put the devil in his place. Don't give him power that he doesn't have. You know, when God finished creation at the end of every day, as God was making the earth, and we read the creation story in Genesis, it says at the end of every day that God looked at what he'd made and he said, it's good, it's good. Then when he finished the whole earth and creation of man and everything, he said this, he said, it was very good. It was very good. And so the earth that was given to mankind, it was good. It was healthy. Didn't have some of the issues that we see today. But it was only after the fall of Adam and Eve that we begin to see temptation and sin and just open the door for the devil and all of that went on. And now mankind, although made in the image of God, is a broken image, is a damaged image, an image that's been stained by sin. And, and, and we see the sinful nature operating in man. Uh, probably the easiest way to describe that is to talk about the fruit of a sinful nature, that is selfishness. Jealousy, greed, lust, envy, strife, all of these things. But not only that, but sickness and disease was introduced into the earth after the fall of man. Jesus ministered to somebody one time and he even commented about the fact that they were sick because of a demonic spirit. It was Satan who had made them the way that they were. And so mankind has relinquished some authority and allowed the devil, a spiritual trespasser, if you will, to have his way on the earth. And that's why there are so many things that go on in the world today where we look and we say to ourselves, how can people treat people like that? You know, we look at some of the evil things that go on and we're like, how can people treat people like that? Well, I'll tell you how, because they've been influenced by that spiritual trespasser who who brought in a a terrible attitude of heart and, and horrible thoughts in their mind and they acted on those things but we are called to rule the earth. We are called to subdue it, to bring it into subjection. And when it comes to Satan, we could not do that on our own. However, God took care of that. You know, way back in Genesis chapter three, the scriptures speak about Jesus defeating the devil. In Genesis chapter three, 14 and 15, it says, the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle more than every beast in the field. And on your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. And then scripture says this, he shall bruise you on the head and you will bruise him on the heel. He will bruise you on the head, you will bruise him on the heel. Look what God said to the serpent. And and look what God didn't say to the serpent. What God didn't say is after Adam and Eve had fell, God didn't say, hold up, I'll come right down, straighten that all out for you. That's not what he did. Instead, he used a man. So why did he do that? Because he'd already given the earth to mankind. He said, you rule it, you subdue it. So for God to violate that would go back on what his word was. And so what does he do? He comes to earth in the form of Jesus the man Christ Jesus. It was Jesus who came to earth and had his heels bruised when they were, when his feet were, you know, nailed to a cross for us. And it was Jesus who put the serpent, put the Satan underneath his feet. And it was Jesus who defeated the devil on the resurrection and at the cross that led to the resurrection brought about the defeat of the devil. Now in Romans chapter 16 and verse 19, the scripture says this, for the report of your obedience has reached to all. Therefore, I am rejoicing over you, but I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. And then he says this, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, under your feet. God has put the devil under your feet. 
He started it through Jesus. Jesus broke his power. Jesus put him under his feet. Now he says, guess what? He stays under your feet. You don't, you don't need to have a mentality that says, oh, the devil, he's so big, and you know, how can we pray and be effective because that devil is so big? No, he's not. He's under your feet. He's not the head you are. He's under your feet. Satan is under your feet. He's not over your head. And, and that was defeated at the resurrection, and now it's your job to live a life that keeps him under your feet. The problem is when we have a mindset that we make the devil so powerful that we're subject to him. And if we have that mindset, then literally we're empowering something that has no power. But we're to live with the devil under our feet. Okay, one more thought. Your prayers are to command the will of God into the circumstances of your life. This is where it all kind of ties together. This is where you got, you got to get this. You got to get this. You need to pray like you're in charge because you are. You need to speak change into the problems that you face. You need to speak blessing into areas that might be struggling and call that into being. You, you need to speak to your life circumstance and you need to command peace and provision, and health, and holiness, and wisdom, and every other thing that God promises for your life. You are never to beg for those things. You are not a beggar. You are a child of the king. He gave you authority. He caused you to have rule and dominion on this earth, and you are to command his blessing and his way into the earth. Just look at how the word of God talks about prayer in a couple more scriptures here. Mark chapter 11, 22. It says, and Jesus answered, saying to them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it'll be granted to him. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and they will be granted to you. Notice that in this prayer, we're not asking God if he would move the mountain for us. That's not what the prayer is saying. This prayer is not, well, I want you to go to God and, you know, just ask him. And maybe, maybe if it's the Lord's will, he'll go ahead and move that for you. God's will it doesn't really even come into play here. The only thing that comes into play is our confidence that God is going to answer. And then it says, you're to speak to the mountain. Not talk about the mountain, not ask God to move the mountain. You're to speak to the mountain and you're to declare your will over that mountain and what you believe should happen because God has given you rule and dominion on the earth. We're not begging God to act on our behalf. That, that's not prayer. That's not what prayer should look like. We are exercising our authority and our own will to bring about what we know is God's best for our lives and the lives of others. And so we're to have faith in God. We're to have a faith that God will respond. Have a faith also that God has positioned you to be in charge in your life and on the earth. Our prayers are not tentative. Our, our prayers are not shy. Our prayers are not begging. Our prayers are not questioning the will of God. We're not going into prayer going, Lord, I, I don't know if it's your will. We, we got this little virus problem going on here right now. And I'm just wondering if, no, that's not what we are doing. We are speaking to it, yes. commanding it to die, yes. declaring it will be over and declaring that we will get victory over this thing and freedom once again in our lives. Yes. Matthew chapter six and verse nine says this, pray then in this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now look at this, just this next part. I wanna focus on this next part. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I don't know about you, but that doesn't really sound like a request. It sounds more like a commandment. That doesn't really sound like, like, you know, God, if, if you think you could do this and pull this off, it'd be really nice. It just sounds a lot more like a declaration. Yes. It's a declaration. It's a commandment. It is a speaking into the life circumstances that we are in and saying, God, we want your kingdom. We want your will. Let it be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we know heaven isn't dealing with a virus. We know heaven isn't dealing with 
sin and sickness and violence and all the evil that we see that happens on earth because of the evil one. We know that in heaven, things are right with God. And we're to declare heaven on earth. The way you pray for your life is to declare the will of God. Don't speak it like it's a question, because it's not. Declare it because it's a provision and a promise. Speak to the situation of your life. Speak to your health and declare healing. Speak to your financial situation and declare provision is coming in Jesus' name. You will not lack. You know, your will be done, God. But understand this, you are praying that way because why? Because there's a spiritual trespasser who'd like to see you fail. There's an enemy who would like to see you unhealthy. He'd like to see you, uh, he would like to see you, you know, get sick and die. He'd like to see you lose money, all the rest of it. The Bible clearly says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came that we might have life. And I want to encourage you as we pray, especially in this season, to declare thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Speak to the mountain, command it to move. God's given you the authority to go ahead and do that. We're going to begin to wrap up and I just want to invite you to join me in prayer. You might want to stand and stretch your legs and just, if it helps you just to focus as we take this moment here, but I want to pray for everyone who's watching. I want to believe God together and I'm going to invite you to join me in your faith as well as we take this moment for prayer. Father God, we, we come before you right now and Lord, in, in this time as we're dealing with a pandemic, Father, we're declaring death to that disease. We're declaring an end to that life of that virus. Father, we're declaring in Jesus' name that this thing stop moving through the earth. God, that it, that it be treated. We're declaring victory, Father God, over this sickness. We thank you, Father God, that you, Lord, have already provided for us the means by which to kill this. Lord, I thank you for the people in advance that are about to discover it. And we pray that be quickened. I thank you, Lord God, for empowering us to stop this virus from moving any further to contain it, but also, Lord, to overcome it so that we live in freedom, that we don't need to live in prison by it. And so, Father, our prayer is that it comes to an end and it comes to an end quickly. I pray for our nation that we would see it turn around quicker than it's even being predicted right now. I'm just believing, Father, you will quicken the end to this thing in Jesus' name and may you get the glory for doing that. Father, I'm praying for every person, Lord God, listening, that they'd have protection. I thank you for Psalms 91, that Lord, as we, as we walk with you, there's a promise of protection from every sickness and every disease. I declare that promise, Father God, over everyone who's listening to this. Father, I also declare provision, that Lord, that we don't need to fear lacking. You said, don't, don't worry about what's gonna take place when it comes to what you're gonna eat, what you're gonna wear, where you're gonna live. But our God in heaven takes care of us. And so, Father, I declare provision for people. Father, I, I speak against fear from taking a hold of people's hearts. Instead, Lord, you said that we should pray and have faith in God. Lord, may our faith be encouraged here today in Jesus' name. And I want to take a moment to pray one more prayer because I believe there's people listening today that, that you need to know Jesus. You need to know him as your Savior. You need to know him as your Lord. You know, we live our lives thinking we've got it under control and we can just keep God at a distance. We don't, we don't have to be bothered with God and we don't have to be concerned about what might be right with God and what might be wrong with God because we kind of got it all under control. But boy, I'll tell you one thing this pandemic has taught us and that is how out of control we really are, how fragile, how weak we really are. It's taught us the fact that this idea that we can just be independent of God and it doesn't matter is a big lie in our lives, that we need Jesus, we need a savior, uh, we need a hope that goes beyond the grave. And that hope is only found in Jesus Christ. And it's a wonderful thing to know Jesus and to know that there's an eternal life that uh, lays ahead for us so that we don't walk with fear. Instead, we know God's presence in our life. We are comforted by that and we've learned that life is just a whole lot better being done with a relationship with God than keeping him at bay. 
But maybe for you, you've been that one that's kept him at a distance. This is your opportunity to change that. This is your opportunity to pray. And I'm gonna lead you in a prayer right now. It's just a simple prayer of acknowledging your sin has separated you, but Christ is your savior. A prayer that surrenders to Jesus as Lord, to follow him with all your heart. And I just invite you to pray along right where you are. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died for me. You paid for my sins. I ask you to forgive me and I invite you into my life and I confess you as my savior and the Lord of my life. I'm gonna follow you with all my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer, I just welcome you to, you know, to make use of our website and, and send in a comment. You know, just, just go ahead and email us and let us know. As a matter of fact, there's a connect card right on the website. You can let us know, hey, today I prayed, gave my life to Jesus. We want to know if you did that because we do have resources that we're going to be providing online for you. And so if you email in, let us know that. We'll be in touch with you. We'll send you those resources that will help you grow and go forward in your walk with God. Well, as I begin to wrap this up, I, I just want to make mention of our offering. Obviously, things are very different uh, in our world right now. But um, when it comes to the church finances, the church is still very much active. As a matter of fact, I've watched the staff probably work harder than ever as everything's been changing so fast and just keeping up and everything that we're doing. And so I, I just want to encourage you that your giving matters. Your giving matters. And uh, you can make use of uh, the website or the app to be able to use the giving option there. And you know what? We just appreciate your faithfulness. Whatever God empowers you to be able to do, um, we just want you to know something. It's very much appreciated in this season. God bless. We look forward to being, again, being together again real soon. If you prayed that prayer to receive Christ, congratulations. We want to connect with you and let you know how we can help you as you begin your walk with Christ. Fill out the online connect card and let us know that you received or rededicated your life to Christ. You can find that to the right of this video or in the comments on Facebook Live. Again, if you have kids, we have Celebration Kids curriculum on our website for you and your kids to enjoy. Click the COVID-19 updates and select your kids curriculum tab. If you're participating in giving today, you can do so on our website, celebrationedmonton.com. That's it for today's service. Have a great week.